أعوذ بالله سميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Regarding the issue of an inferiority complex that has developed in many of the nations around the world especially the Muslim nations due to being colonized, due to being enslaved uh, this is something that has to do with our situation today it's a very relevant subject, why? Because we as a ummah are dealing with the consequences of that today. And the division and the, and the uh, ills that we see in the ummah, a lot of the issues of terrorism and things, these are the consequences of that brutality that our ummah went through. Before we talk about these consequences that we're dealing with today, I want to talk about history. Uh, yani if you look at uh, history, on how we got here, meaning as an ummah, how did we get colonized, how did we get enslaved, how did people from Europe who were fewer in number, who were in many ways not as advanced as a civilization, as the places that they went, uh, how were they able to conquer those areas and colonize most of Africa, most of Southeast Asia, and all these other parts of the world, and how were they able to go into countries and tribes and enslave free people, a people who were honorable people, a people who were uh, in many ways very advanced in that time. How were they able to enslave them and bring them to the United States, which is today called the United States, Americas, and other parts of the world. So for this, you have to go back and, and read history. Um, there are two very important books to understand the, the, the mindset of those Europeans and how were they able to colonize the vast majority of the world at the time, especially the British. Even though the French and the Italian and the Portuguese, everybody got in on the action, but the British were the most effective at it, no doubt. There are two books that I studied when I was doing my master's. And uh, this was a while back, but I was doing it for my history lessons. One of them uh, is called the Malakand Field Force. And this is, both of these books are by Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, uh, a hero to a lot of people, was, uh, we'll talk about his reality. But he wrote this work, and, and Malakand is an area in which currently in northern Pakistan. At that time, it was the area that was Afghanistan and the border of that to India. Um, in Malakand, the British and Khaybar, what is called Khaybar today, uh, the area is called Khaybar Pukhtunkhwa, the British were stopped, they were defeated. Vince, yani Churchill himself was defeated. So he wrote extensively about that area and the British defeat and why were they not able to be effective and what, what should be done to be effective. Yani he wrote this for a British audience to understand. That, in the second book, that uh, same author, Winston Churchill, uh, it's called The River War. And this is about the British advances in Sudan and the war in Sudan and their colonization of Sudan. And I chose these two books when I was, and this is years ago, it wasn't for this particular lesson, because it showed the expansion of the British as a colonial force in two places where there is a large number of Muslims. One is what's called the Indian subcontinent, and the second being uh, Africa. And, and I'm going to summarize uh, a few points that, that, that he put, and uh, it's from other works as well, but just to understand their mindset. The first thing uh, he very clearly writes uh, is that in order for you to be effective, you have to make the indigenous population feel inferior. And you have to understand that you have to believe that you are superior. Uh, one clear example of this is when he talks about uh, the Indian and Gurkha and, uh, and other soldiers that were fighting alongside the British soldiers in their defeat in Malakan and in their defeat in Khaybar. And they talk, he talked, he said, well, the British soldiers being younger of age uh, are still effective. Uh, and if they're not, it's only because they're young uh, and the other soldiers have more experience, other Indian soldiers in war. Uh, but they are still superior as a race to the others. And, and this is very interesting. Even amongst his own ranks, he was putting this idea that British soldiers were, were, were genetically superior to the others that were fighting alongside. And this, the kind of mindset that was left then. And that's why 
if you look at till today, till today, if you go to India, if you go to Pakistan, if you go to Bangladesh, if you go to these countries that were colonized by the British, they have an inferiority complex left over from that time where if you speak English, you are considered educated. You are considered superior to those who don't speak English. If you dress in a style that resembles the British or the West, you are automatically assumed to be of a higher caliber of society, uh, yani educated and wealthy. And if you dress in the local or the traditional garbs, you are taken as you know, less educated, ignorant, backwards. Why? Because mentally the slavery was left behind. It wasn't just a physical slavery. We find the same thing in Africa. In Africa, the British, if you look at the River War and the writings of Winston Churchill, he had the same ideas of making the Africans feel inferior to the British that were coming and to leave that mindset even divided between the Africans. Till today we find this. Lighter skinned Africans and darker skinned Africans and those who call themselves Arab Africans and, uh, you know, uh, even though if, if they look exactly the same, if they act exactly the same, they eat exactly the same, they're from the same people, they feel a, a, a need to feel superior to the other. And what is the criteria of being superior? Being closer to the way the, the masters, the, the colonizers looked. And the same thing is true in the United States that we see from the effects of slavery. What did those slave owners do? The first thing they did is they took away the identity. They took away names. And today we see people with names like Washington, that, 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 that's not their actual family ethnic names. These were enforced upon them by slave owners like George Washington, like those that they are praised in the West today. But these were slave owners. These were people that were part of that, 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 that crime committed against humanity, where they didn't just enslave a people, they took away that people's religion. They enforced them to leave Islam as many of the slaves that were brought. Not all, but many of them were Muslim. And they forced them to leave their languages and their culture and their identity and enforce their own culture and religion by force on them. Now, when we talk about Winston Churchill in his writings, and you know he was somebody who was instrumental in, in the British Empire's uh, colonization of Africa and of much of Asia, he writes about the idea of divide and conquer. And there's something you find across the board in the colonial handbook, that the idea was to divide and conquer. Well, how will you divide and conquer? How will you divide? And again, uh, I'm not going to go into specifics about how they dealt with Hindus and stuff because this is targeted towards my Muslim brothers and sisters. So I'm going to talk about some of what they did. And this is historic facts. I'm not talking about opinions. I'm talking about facts that you can go and check. He talks about divide and conquer, but how he doesn't talk about how to implement that against Muslims. That we go back to history. In 1831, 1831, one of the great scholars of the Ahlul Hadith, of the people of Hadith, a great scholar of يعني, the Salafi Aqidah, Shah Ismail Shaheed, the author of the book Taqwiyat al Iman that many of us have read and, and have benefited from. He also wrote a book called uh, Anwar al Nur al Aynain, Fi Mas'al Raf al Yadain. Yeah, and regarding the issue of raising the hands when going to Ruku and getting up, a book that I found a manuscript and benefited from. This great scholar, he took up jihad against the British who were moving into India, even though at that time they had not conquered all of India. In his writings, he talks about how the British were trying to conquer. What they did is they went and they would go to one of the yeah, any Muslim kings. And, and unfortunately, the Muslims were divided into small kingdoms of yani, Laknau and so on and so on. So they will go to one and they did the same thing with Hindus and they did the same, same thing with others. And they would tell them that, look, your neighbor is about to buy a lot of weaponry from. We're the East India Trading Company. They didn't call it the British Empire. They didn't call it, yani, we're conquering you. No, no, we just want to trade with you. And the same thing with you today. Oh, we, we just want to bring freedom and democracy. We're not trying to uh, take your oil or take your natural resources or destroy your religious uh, uh, tradition. No, no. We just want to come and develop a friendship here. So in the idea of the East India Trading Company, they would go and say, okay, your neighbor is going to buy a lot of weapons from us. And, you know, he may use them, 
to take over your little kingdom. So if you want, we'll protect you. And what we'll do is we'll take what's called lagan. Lagan was what? A, a tax of food, whatever you have. And we'll just take that from you and you'll have our protection. And they would do the same thing with the neighbor and the others. They would go to each one. What a racket. And straight mafia style. They would go and say, you know what? Your other neighbor, he's already giving us lagan. We've already given him protection. Now, if he attacks you and he's got our weapons and our support, then that's how it's going to be. So then they got all these, these little kingdoms to submit until they put them so much in debt as uh, is being done today. And if you look at the World Bank and all the things that go on, same thing today. And it will give you a loan, but it's going to be riba. And if you can't pay it, then we're going to enforce certain rules on you. And if you follow those rules, we'll let you keep that lifeline of, of money coming. And even though we're taking all your natural resources, but the day you don't, we're going to pull that loan and you're going to go bankrupt. And your country's going to go into chaos. Same things we are being tricked by today. So Shah Ismail Shaheed, he took up the banner of jihad and, and he couldn't find support in India. So he went to the northern parts, uh, which is current day Pakistan, uh, Peshawar, as he writes himself. And he got the Pashtun people to rally around him. And he fought the British until he became a Shaheed in 1831. I want you guys to pay attention to these dates. 1831. In 1857, there was also a revolt and, and a battle uh, by the Muslims and, and Muslim scholars participated and the British, they carried out a massacre, killed a lot of scholars. So now what do you have? You have a lot of the very strong scholars who were in the correct aqidah that were pushing for, for, for the sharia and all of that having been killed and you have a vacuum. So what do the British do? Is they develop and they allow the development of certain madaris. Now again, I told you, pay attention to the dates. In, so again, 1831, Shah Ismail Shaheed becomes Shaheed. He becomes a martyr. He's a big Shaheed. 1857, scholars are massacred. Massacred. In 1866, there is a madrasa developed by a sheikh named Muhammad Qasim called Deoband. Deoband Go look it up. Google, when did Deoband begin? In 1866, under British rule. Now, it's very interesting that at a time when many ulema were being killed, the, the British allowed the development of this madrasa. In 1904, 1866, Deoband began. In 1904, a rival madrasa is set up in a Brelvi, which is called in Brelv, in a place in India, which is called the Brelvi Madrasa, developed by Ahmad Raza Khan. That is in 1904. Now you have these two madaris at war with each other. And the British are allowing it. Why? They, they want to put the Muslims... At, and people think, oh, Deoband and Brail, this has been around since time of Sahaba. No. These are things that developed and were, were initiated during the rule of the British. The aqidah of the Salaf, the people who stick to the hadith, the athar, this has been since the time of the Salaf. No doubt. This is the aqidah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the Qur'an of the Sahaba. Yes. But these other... Yani denominations that developed, developed later. Deoband and Brail started both under British India. In Deoband being at 1866 of the earlier of the two, and in 1904, Ahmad Raza Khan started the madrasa which developed the Brailwi school of thought. During that British rule, it wasn't just that. During that British rule, they developed a madrasa called Jami' al Ahmadiyya, and it was a movement. And this is what's called the Qadiani Aqidah. And this was in 1889. Now again, I said pay attention to the dates because now you see the slaughter of the ulema came first and then in that vacuum, these British approved aqaid developed. And you have the Ahmadiyya sect, which is called the Qadiyaniya, correctly, developed in 1889 by Ghulam uh, Mirza Ahmad uh, as a, yani Mirza Ghulam Ahmad as a yani British approved. Now, now, just to understand this wasn't just for the time do you know where the headquarters for that movement the Qadiani movement is today London look it up London till today that support is there right then you have a movement that was already there called the Ismaili movement and the Ismaili movement has the current leader called Agha Khan this is the head of the sect the first Agha Khan who was he 
The first Aga Khan was a man named Muhammad, uh, Hassan Ali Shah. Uh, and he is, his actual birth name is Muhammad Hassan Al Husseini. He is well known as Hassan Ali Shah. Even though he was ethnically and, and his, his movement was in Iran, but due to some internal fightings, he was invited and he went to British India. And that's where the British gave him the title of Aga Khan. The first Aga Khan, even though we have one today, and guess where their, their headquarters is? Not in any Muslim land. Their headquarters today is in Lisbon, Portugal. Right? Another colonial force. The British sponsored him. And, uh, and historically, if you look up the writings of King Edward VII, King Edward VII, in 1860, when he gave support for the Aga Khan, at that time, which is uh, Hassan Ali Shah, to come to India and to reside and be protected under British India. He gave him a special status called this, a spiritual head of an important Muslim community. Now, if you were on the Athari or Salafi, if you were on that Aqeed of Quran or Sunnah, you didn't get that title. You didn't get that support. But because you were on a, 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 a movement to split the Muslim Ummah, you got that special title and that special support. This is history. This is not opinion. Go and look up the history and of uh, the first Aga Khan, Hassan Ali Shah, and his relationship with King Edward VII, and, and, the, and the entitlement that was given, the title that was given from King Edward VII to him, called the special uh, spiritual head of an important Muslim community, and he was given support and protection and, and, and wealth and all of that to do that propagation out of British India. Now, what happens in the Ummah? And again, this I'm, I'm giving some facts about India, but the same thing happened in Africa. If you look at the history of, of Africa and in Libya, for example, the Italians and, and the massacre of ulama and uh, Sheikh al-Shuhada, Umar Mukhtar, yani when he fought, and, and these, these were people who were Quran teachers, these were people who were ulama and how they were massacred and killed and, and genocide that went on by these colonial powers. If you talk about India, and I want you to understand this because we in the West are taught about Winston Churchill being this hero of World War II. We were taught about uh, yani, uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson being the fathers of the nation, these great thinkers, but, but read history. How did they treat their slaves? How did George Washington rape his slaves? And how many children and generations are from those rapes? Uh, nobody wants to talk about that. And the, the effect of that today on us, I want to mention uh, some more history here to understand how the colonial powers subdued a population. We talked about divide and conquer, giving an idea of inferiority, which is still in place today, unfortunately. But also economic starvation. I don't mean starvation like, like just an economic hardship. I mean literal starvation. Under Winston Churchill and under the British rule in India, there is a historic event that many people don't know about today. And this is called the Bengal famine. The famine of Bengal. Uh, it is missing from Churchill's writing. I mean, he doesn't talk about it. Why? Because he doesn't want to talk about it. But he does talk about the economic sources used for colonization. Now, how did he actually implement that? Let me tell you. In India, which was a, a very fertile land. I mean, there was a lot of food that was, that was grown in India. Uh, there was, it was a place where, I mean, even if you look at today, some of the best tea in the world, many of the best mangoes and things are in that subcontinent. I mean, great food there. It wasn't an issue of shortage of food. But the British started taking their lagan. They started taking their cut and exporting that to Europe and, and using a lot of those resources for World War II. But in India now, you had famines. The Bengal famine is famous, but I recorded from my own research 11 famines in India during the British Raj, which is the British rule of India. And the death toll that has been reported from these 11 famines is at 40 million. 40 million people died of starvation in India under Winston Churchill when India had enough food to feed them. 
But that food was taken from India and it was sent to Europe. And because of that, and other obviously reasons that caused hardships, 40 million people died in 11 famines during British rule. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go deep uh, into a lot of the other war crimes that were committed by Winston Churchill and others in Europe and Afri in, in Africa and Asia. But one of the things, the British legacy that they left was to sow the seeds of division, was to not let those people be free, even when, it, and this is in some of the writings of Winston Churchill that he sent to those that were still controlling India towards the end of the British rule there, around the 19, late 1920s. 1947 is when they ended the rule in India. He said that you must understand that these inferior people must be subdued by the superior race for the natural balance. Look at this mindset. And this is how they dealt with this, is they considered that, that they were superior, so it was their right to brutally uh, massacre and, and to rape and to pillage the people that were there in Somalia, in, in, in Africa, in Asia. Not just that. Now, now think about this. When we had slavery, the church, the Catholic church, you can Google this, look this up, and other Protestant churches, they sanctified, they, they approved of slavery. How? They said that God created man in his image. According to them, God was a white man, a white Jesus, even though we know historically that's not correct. But not going there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for example, described Isa ibn Maryam uh, alayhi salam having dark hair. But they made a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. And they said, well, that's God. And God made man in his image. So those that are black, those that are brown, those that are of other eye color and hair color and skin color are not humans. Because God made man in his image. So these aren't men. These are animals. They can be sold and they can be bought. And, and, and today, those same churches are, are, are the majority in many of these uh, communities in America, amongst African Americans and, and Latinos. And, and, and how did Latin America, how did the Spanish deal with Latin America? They didn't come there and just uh, give out books and, and have good relations and trade. Like the Muslims that went to Indonesia and things where their trade was their akhlaq, their manners were such that areas became Muslim. That's not how Latin America became Latin. <laughs> It wasn't Latin America to begin with. That's not how Spanish was brought here. That's not how Catholicism and Christianity was brought here. It was brought with genocide. It was brought with uh, destroying the culture, the language, the religions that were there, and, and by force, enforcing. And that's how many parts of the United States to, were taken. It's by force. How do you think the Native Americans that were here were taken? They, they, they could have at that time. And he, they could have killed off all the settlers, but because they trusted the settlers, a mistake that they paid for, the settlers came and, and, and genocide and massacred them. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. Now, the effects of that on us today. The first thing the British did, especially the British, and also the French and the Italians and others, is sow the seeds of conflict. India and Pakistan, in 1947, August 14th for Pakistan and August 15th for India, a day later, were liberated from British rule. British Raj, as it was called, was taken off. But what was the agreement? The agreement was that they would make two countries, a Muslim country, which is called Pakistan, and a Hindu majority country, which would be called India. And every area with the Muslim majority would go to the Muslims. And that's why Muslims were on two parts, two separate sides. They became East Pakistan and West Pakistan. East Pakistan later became Bangladesh. And the parts that were with Hindu majority would become India. Agreed, signs were made. Who made those lines? A man named Sir Creo Radcliffe. Sir Radcliffe had never been to India. He had never been to India with a British lawyer. And he made the line such to make sure that there's conflict. And what did they do? They made such lines that where there were Muslim rulers 
with a Hindu majority like Lucknow and other places like this, they would go to India still. But places with a Muslim majority that should have gone to Pakistan, according to the agreement, like Kashmir, would be signed over to Pakistan and India. So now you had a Hindu king or mayor, governor, whatever in Kashmir, but you had a Muslim majority. In Lucknow and Hyderabad, in these places, you had a Hindu majority but a Muslim king. But they said, you know what, that has to go to India because it's in the middle of India, we don't want division. With Kashmir, it was connected to Pakistan, but they said, you know what, no, we're going to mess this up. We're going to tell Pakistan, yeah, it's yours. We're going to tell India, it's yours. So the British left, but that conflict stayed. Until today, we have that conflict going on. Wars have been fought. Same thing they did in Iraq. They took lands of people who traditionally didn't live together. And they cut them in a way, for example, the Kurdish population, they split them between three countries so that there would be conflict. The same thing they did in Africa. They drew lines as such to have conflict and they kept things like the Commonwealth. They kept things like agreements that, that those countries like Mali in Africa had to agree to for the French anytime till today they can walk in with their army and arrest anybody they want and kill anybody they want. In, in, in all of these countries, they, in Somalia, in, in Ethiopia, if you look at the Arumu people and all these things that happen, why? This was by design. Read their writings. This divide and conquer was by design. Now, history is history. And if you don't know history, you can't really work with the future much. But what about us today? And what about fixing the situation? So first thing to understand, one of the earliest causes of this was the massacre and killing of ulama, whether in Libya, whether in Somalia, and, and same thing. I mean, we could go down with any country was a mass genocide targeted at scholars, the scholars of this ummah. So what happened? They took the knowledge away from the Ummah. So when the knowledge is gone, when the leaders of the Ummah, the, 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 the inheritors of the Anbiya are gone, then the Awam, the regular people are, are like sheep. And they put in their own versions of Islam. Until today, it's good. we need an American version of Islam. Why? Why do we need a Chinese Islam? Why do we need? We have one Islam, Alhamdulillah. It is the Islam from the Quran, the Islam from the Sahih Ahadith, the Islam from the Sunnah, the Islam of the Salaf of this Ummah, the Islam of the Sahaba. This is Islam. This is it. قال الله وقال رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم. That's what we need. We don't need an African Islam. We don't need a Pakistani Islam. We don't need an Afghani Islam. We don't need an Indian Islam. We don't need an Indonesian Islam. We don't need a Malay Islam. We don't need an American Islam. We need the Islam from the Qur'an with Sunnah and that is what united the Salaf of this Ummah. And that is what will unite this Ummah. Going back to the Qur'an with Sunnah. These divisions of nationalities, of tribalism, of, of taking yourself as superior to somebody else because of the color of your skin or the color of your eyes or if your hair is straight or curly, if you have good hair or bad hair as the slave masters in any they, they put this mindset into us and, and look at how they dealt with slavery. They took a people, but they knew they couldn't control them just by themselves. So they would have what they call the house, yani nigger, negro, whatever. And I hate to use the word, but this is history. And the house negro, what he would do is he would be black himself, but he would consider himself superior to the field negroes. And he would be told, you are better because you are in the house or you are lighter skin, or you are closer to the master. And then he would be the rat, he would be the enforcer, he would be the punisher for the others. The same thing they did in Pakistan and India. Oh, you're light skinned. Oh, you speak English. You're educated, you're civilized, you're not one of the savages. The same thing you find in the Native Americans. The story of Pocahontas is not a, a fairy tale. This is a tale of rape and imprisonment and using uh, a people against their own people. I want to talk about solutions. I don't want to just talk about what happened and what the problems and this, because what good is that? What is the solution? The solution is the Kitab wa Sunnah. When the Muslims go back to seeking knowledge, because what was taken away first, what did they do? They took away knowledge. When the Muslims go back to seeking knowledge, 
when they know their religion, then this terrorism and these fake groups developed by the West to divide the Muslims will not take hold. Because what happens when you don't have ulama, then anybody can give you a fatwa, go kill this person, it's for Islam, go do this for Islam. And the ignorant, they do it. But when you have knowledge, you will question that. Wait a minute, you can't kill innocent people, that's not in Islam. Why am I doing this? Why am I fighting them? And when you seek knowledge, then these problems start to go away. When you seek knowledge, then you say, what, what Deoband, what Braille, what Qadiani, what this? We're Muslim. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called us Muslim. The Prophet called us Muslim. This is what our identity is. This is who we are. And the tricks of shaitan are such that sometimes in response to that, we go to another extreme. And what we develop is nationalism. And what we saw in the pan-Arab nationalistic movement against the British in trying to liberate the, their lands, they didn't liberate Muslim lands. They didn't say we want to do it for Islam. They said we did it for pan-Arab nationalism. So what happened is they would have these revolts, but, but a nationalistic revolt. So where is the barakah? And then we see the results in what's called the Six-Day War. The Six-Day War all these Arab countries under the banner of nationalism and Arab nationalism, they, they fought Israel six days, they got beat. <laughs> and, uh, one of the ulema from Egypt, and the ulema of Egypt are, they have a good sense of humor. He was asked by one of the people, he said, what happened to the malaika of Badr in, in, in this war against Israel? The sheikh, as a, in a joking way, he said, the malaika came, but they didn't know which side was the Muslims. You guys look the same as the Jews. Your uniforms, your dress, your way, you don't make salah, you drink, what's the difference? And this is, a, but even though the Sheikh said this in, in a humorous manner, but this is something to think about. Why have we been losing? Because we've been trying to follow somebody else, Atatürk, and these ideas of trying to be something we're not. Why not be who we are? We're Muslims. What is our way? The way of Rasulullah sallallahu well, Even if you think of dress code, like if you look at this imamah, this is not a ethnic dress code. In my areas of, of Bukhtunkhwa, in the Pashtun area, it became our dress when the Sahaba came and we saw the Sahaba with this dress, we took that dress. We adopted that identity. Islam became our identity. That's how it has to become. We cannot be fighting for Pashtun nationalism. You cannot be fighting for pan-African nationalism, pan-Arab nationalism, pan-anything nationalism. You can't be fighting for Palestine. You've got to be fighting for Islam. If it's about just Palestinians and you're another people, the Israelis are another people, whoever wins, wins. But if it's for Islam, then the Nusra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come. If it's about Arab nationalism, then don't expect the Nusra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arab is no better than the non-Arab in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever has taqwa will get the Nusra from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are Muslim, if you are Mu'min, if you are a people of Iman, then it is a haq on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you Nusra. But if you're not fighting for la ilaha illallah, if you're not fighting for Islam, if you're fighting for any nationalistic cause, then you might win, you might lose. Just like anybody else. And he said, don't expect the answer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Muslims, we have to go back to the way of the Salaf of this Ummah. We have to go back to the way of Sahaba radiyanhum. The Salaf of Salihin, they set an example for us. When they became Muslim, Islam became their identity. Even though they didn't forget who they are. They were Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, was from the Ghaffari tribe. He was still called Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari. Nothing wrong with the Salman al-Farasi, he's still called Farasi. Nothing wrong with identification of their race and their tribe and their background and their languages, alhamdulillah. But when the Muslims fought the people of Faras and the people of Faras, and you can look in, uh, we have our YouTube channel, Majd Ribat. We have the Tariq Durus. And if you talk about the battles in there and the Seerah, and then Khalaf Abu Bakr and Umar radiyanhu, you will find the references I've given there when Salman al-Farasi on the side of the Arab, majority Arab Muslims, yani the Sahaba were mostly Arab. When he was fighting the Persians, the Persians tried to tempt him. They told him, you're a Persian. Come join us, stay a Muslim, but join us on our side. Salman al-Farasi said, la. He said, today these are my brothers. You Persians are not my brothers because the brotherhood is Iman. You Persians are not my brothers, the Arab are my brothers. Why? Because they're Muslim and I'm Muslim. And you're Kafir, so the brotherhood with you is gone. The brother of Iman is what unites us. The Sahaba, عنهم, they had this. They didn't say, okay, Bilal, uh, you are black, so you go rule Africa. And uh, uh, for example, Amr ibn As, you're, you're Arab, you're light-skinned, you go rule Sham. No. Whoever was born, Bilal Radian ruled Sham. The lightest-skinned people in the Ummah of that time were Sham. Bilal Radian, black man. Sahabi, he ruled them. Why? He was qualified. 
Amr ibn al-As, he was light-skinned. If you look in Asira, he was very light-skinned. And he ruled Egypt. He ruled parts of Africa. It didn't matter your skin color. It wasn't about that. It was about Islam. It was about Iman. It was about qualifications. Whoever had taqwa, whoever had adal, whoever was closer to Allah, that's what we have to go back to. No more Somali masajid, no more Afghani masajid, no more Arab masajid, and no African-American masajid and Latino masajid. No, Muslim masajid. A masjid for the Muslims. Whatever race you may be, whatever language you may be from, whatever background you may come from, you are Muslim, you are my brother, you pray next to me, you are equally a part of my community, you are equally a part of my masjid. This mindset has to come. This is the legacy of colonialism that we have to throw, that we are Pakistanis. What is Pakistan? 50, 60 years ago, what, there was no Pakistan. We are, we are uh, Somali and Ethiopian and this. Who drew these lines? The British. Otherwise, the Arumis and Arumu, uh, somebody who's Dawood or Hawiya, they're a tribe that have been there for way before that. Where did this identity come from? From the British. We are Moroccan, we are Syrian, we are Algerian. Who drew these lines? The French and Italians and them? No, we are Muslim. Alhamdulillah. I may be black, I may be white, I may be brown, I may be of different ethnic background, I may be of a different tribe. Alhamdulillah, nothing wrong with that. I, I, I don't lose that identity, but my Brotherhood is based on Iman. If I care more about Palestine because I'm Palestinian and I don't care about the Muslims of China because I'm not Chinese, there is a problem with my Iman. If I care about black lives mattering, but I don't care about Chinese Muslims being killed, something is wrong. We should care about black lives. We should know that there is a, a genocide being carried out against black men and brown men in America by police and by lynchings. And we as Muslims should care. But if that's what I'm really worried about, but I'm not worried about Chinese because I'm black and they're not, there's a problem. If I'm concerned about Afghanistan and because I'm Afghan, but I'm not worried about Bangladesh because I'm not Bengali, there's a problem. What is the solution is we have to be Muslim. We have to care about Islam. Every Muslim is my brother. Every human life I'm concerned about. And if some humans are being targeted like black Americans in America, then I should be concerned about that. That is true. But my concern for my Muslim brothers should be equal across the board. And this is when we get, when we get there, that when we are concerned about our Muslim brothers in China, in, in Africa, in, in Asia, in, in South America, in America, in all these countries equally because of Islam. And we strive and struggle for Palestine, not because it's Palestine, but because Beit al-Muqaddas, because Al-Aqsa belongs to Islam. When we talk about Syria, not because we're Syrians, but because this is Sham, a blessed land, and we want to not take away from one Arab, pan-Arab government to another. Instead, we want to establish Islam based on the Quran was Sunnah. When we unite upon that, when we settle our disagreements on Quran was Sunnah, this is the solution to the problems left over from colonialism. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put us in the kitab and Sunnah and give us true ikhwa, brotherhood in, in the light of, of Tawheed and our brotherhood based on Quran was Sunnah and take away these ideas that the slave masters and colonial powers put in our minds of superiority and divisions and nationalism and, and go back to what the Prophet ﷺ taught us that the Arab is not better than the Ajam and white not better than the black except in taqwa, whoever has taqwa you could be black as night or white as milk it has to do with your taqwa and your knowledge and your closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that should make you lead in our ummah once we get there Insha'Allah Ta'ala, and we will, and we will. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi has told us that the Khilafah will return upon the Manh al Nabuwa and all these tricks and, and, and plans of the Kuffar to try to and he set up fake groups and things will not distract us as an Ummah. They will distract us in a little bit, but we will, as an Ummah, we will raise. We will rise and we will rise from every corner of the world under the banner of La ilaha illallah and we will unite upon the Quran wa Sunnah. It will happen. And we will have this united ummah again under Mahdi alayhi salam and insha'Allah before that. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that gave nusra to this deen. Wa jazakumullahu khairan.